Why your audio is bad and why you can't do anything about it. If you watch my channel regularly, you'll know I'm interested in audio, all the way from production to the eventual listening experience. Pro audio to hi-fi in other words. So let me assume that you're a music lover, which you are because everyone is, and that having great audio is important to you. Let me clarify that. Many people who love music don't particularly care much about the audio quality. If they can hear the music, lyrics, harmonies and performance, etc., clearly enough, that's all they need. I have no problem with that. But some of us prefer that we hear music with great audio, or at least audio that's as good as possible within the constraints of budget and convenience. This is why we have a hi-fi system, aftermarket in-car audio, and a really rather expensive pair of headphones. Oh, and whatever source floats your boat. Streaming, download, CD, vinyl, perhaps even cassette. But you're not getting great audio, and you can't do anything about it. Yes, really, you can't do anything about it. It doesn't matter how much you pay for your source, your turntable, your DAC, your amplifier, your speakers, an acoustic consultant to design and set up your listening room, you're not getting great audio, and you can't do anything about it. I'm going to have to set vinyl aside for the moment, but I promise I will come back to it later. So, having done that, we can assume that your source is either compact disc or an uncompressed streaming service. You're getting as close to the original studio master tapes as possible, and still the audio is bad. What's going wrong? Well, the first thing that's going wrong is that you're listening to masters that were made after 1995. 1995 is the year the loudness war started, with Watch the Story, Morning Glory by Oasis. I know that's a bit like saying that the only thing that started the First World War was the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, but, as in the history books, it's a useful reference point. I said masters that were made after 1995. I include remasters, too. Quick tip. If you want great audio, then only listen to music that was mastered before 1995. Problem solved. <laughs> but clearly, you want to listen to music recorded after 1995 as well. And you can probably only get hold of, or get access to, remasters of music recorded before 1995. So you're listening to the sound of the loudness war. You're not getting great audio, and you can't do anything about it. Your audio is bad and you can't do anything about it. Let me look at this from another point of view, the audiophile's point of view. What I hear in audiophile videos on YouTube and read in audiophile and hi-fi websites and magazines is that something is spoiling your audio experience, and you can do something about it. You need a better turntable, a different cartridge and stylus, a DAC, a better amplifier, better speakers, better interconnects, as they call them. You need to spend money on something, and that something will give you a better listening experience. Or perhaps you could rearrange your listening room. At least that will cost nothing but your time. And what do you get for all this cost, time and trouble? Great audio? No, you don't, because the problem is upstream, where you and your audiophile advisors have no influence. This is key. Audio is already degraded before it gets to you. That stream of bits and bytes that comes in through your broadband connection is degraded. That CD you ordered online, it's already degraded when it pops through your letterbox. Any other source, Blu-ray audio, it's degraded. There's nothing you can do. So, where's the problem? Three places, and I'm going to tell you exactly where, where and where. Let's think of a band, a traditional rock band with vocals, guitars, keyboards and drums. The same will apply to purely electronic music, but with a band we can compare the recorded audio with what we expect the instruments to sound like. In a traditional recording studio such as Abbey Road, this is me in Abbey Road Studio 3, there will be the band, a recording engineer and a producer. The traditional role of the recording engineer is to capture the sound of the musicians accurately and to select and place the microphones in such a way that accurate sound will be captured to the very best effect. The traditional role of the producer is to make sure that the musicians perform to their best and that the sound captured by the engineer is appropriate for the style of music. 
This is an extremely brief summary, but the key is that what goes onto the multi-track recorder, which will be digital audio workstation software these days, is very high in quality. Great audio, in other words. So, what's next? In the olden days, the recording engineer would mix the recording, supervised by the producer. These days, the multi-track normally goes to a specialist mix engineer. This is where things start to go wrong. Now, let me make this clear. I'm not blaming the mix engineer. Well, well, not entirely. The people who do this are as much musicians as the musicians themselves. They know every detail of the technical processes involved, and they can apply their highly tuned musical sensibilities to achieve a great stereo mix. But they don't, because they're being paid by the label they're working for. And their instructions are, make it sound like that. That will be a recording that has recently achieved commercial success. And that, that, will be a recording that mimics an earlier that in sound texture. And that, that, well, we can go all the way back to 1995, an unbroken chain of make it sound like that. <laughs> so how do they make it sound like that? It starts with the mix engineer, followed through by the mastering engineer. There are three places things go wrong. The first is clipping. Technically, clipping is where too much gain sends the signal beyond the limits of an electronic or digital system. The tips of the waveform are, almost literally, clipped off. This creates distortion, harmonics, and additional high frequencies. When I was trained in pro audio, clipping was a bad thing. It was something to be avoided at all costs. OK, we recorded on tape, and we could push the level into mild distortion. But we would never clip the electronics of the mixing console, recorder, or outboard, because it sounded bad. Just bad without question. Well, that's my view. I could look at this over the history of recording. When I came into Pro Audio, technology had already reached its peak, and it was possible for everything to be of absolute crystal clarity. Even the multi-track and stereo tape recorders using Dolby Type-A noise reduction. Prior to that, however, audio was plagued with noise and distortion. So there was a trajectory from noisy and distorted to noise-free and clean. But what comes up must come down. The peak of clinical antiseptic audio arrived with digital multitrack and the Sony 1630, which was used to make CD masters. The compact disc itself. Engineers started to want to dirty things up again. <laughs> I remember one who I spoke to. He said that whenever a new piece of equipment came in, he'd find out what it sounded like when it clipped. Clipping, to him, was a texture to be used. You can see where this is headed. 1995. So now, the modern mix engineer has a plug-in for clipping. Here's an example. The Sound Toys Decapitator. Decapitator. <laughs> Genius. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. I like a bit of texture. I like Jimi Hendrix and his Marshall amplifier. Distortion is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's how much. And in today's music, today's mixing and mastering techniques, it's too much. So this is something a mix engineer can do. Put a clipping plugin into individual tracks. As many tracks as he or she likes. There's no limit and have fun with the distortion. I need to be clear, this can be done tastefully. But it's where the problem with today's audio can start. Let's move on to the mastering engineer, who is also technically expert and musically sensible, and also paid by the label to make it sound like that. <laughs> now, I've worked with mastering engineers, or shall I say, I've been in the same room as mastering engineers while they work. They take a good stereo mix and make it sound better. Simple as that. Well, not quite so simple. With vinyl, the mastering engineer has to make the signal compatible with the vinyl process. Too much, too loud, out-of-phase bass, for instance, will create a shallow groove and problems with tracking. But digital audio, well, there are no limits. The mastering engineer is free to do whatever can be contained within 16 or 24 bits. Let's go back to making a stereo mix sound better. Why didn't the mix engineer make it sound better in the first place? <laughs> well, maybe he or she did, and there's really no mastering left to do. That can happen. But there's always room for a second opinion, a bit of polishing. The mastering engineer masters tracks all day long, day in, day out. 
That's what they do. They have a depth of experience in final sweetening that a mix engineer simply doesn't have. So I have tremendous respect for mastering engineers. No one else can do what they do. So where does it all go wrong? Make it sound like that. Again, that's what the label wants. They want a hit. And what's going to make a song a hit? If it sounds like a song that's already been a hit. That chain of make it sound like that going back to 1995. So this is what mastering engineers have to do. With all their acute hearing skills, technical mastery and sonic musicianship, they have to make it sound like that. And they have the tools. Out and out clipping doesn't sound so good on a stereo mix. It's better on individual tracks. But harmonic enhancement, well, that's certainly fair game. Harmonic enhancement is a euphemism for distortion, as is warmth. Warmth, in audio, is a euphemism for distortion. The word is distortion. The mastering engineer adds distortion. This is all wrong. From my perspective, going back to my early awareness of audio in the 1960s, distortion was all around, and it was a bad thing. There was no doubt about it. Electric guitars, yes. Audio, no. And as technology progressed, both professionally and domestically, distortion became less and less, down to 0.1%, where no one can hear it. OK, tape record is quite a bit more, but the aim was to achieve imperceptible distortion. So now we have digital audio. 24-bit digital audio is capable of distortion figures of not just 0 0.1, 0.001, 0.001, more like. Effectively, none. So some strange kind of logic dictates that mastering engineers need to add it back in. They have equipment and plugins for that. And that's not the end of it. There's the brick wall limiter. A limiter is a device that prevents an audio signal going higher than a set level. A brick wall limiter, or we can call it a mastering limiter, absolutely, absolutely prevents the signal going higher than a set level. Not even by one quantization interval. It does this by looking ahead at the signal, which is of course already recorded, and turning down the gain exactly when it's needed. We sometimes also call this a look-ahead limiter. This is a good thing. It can prevent clipping. The occasional, rare, totally unanticipated unicorn of an event that might otherwise make, once in a very long while, the audio clip. But what does the mastering engineer do with it? <laughs> Push the signal as high as it will go. The limiter isn't just working occasionally, it's working all the time without respite. And the harder you work it, inevitably the more the audio degrades. Trim a couple of decibels off the top and you'll get away with it. Trim more, then the harder the limiting, the harsher, the more degraded the sound. But mastering engineers have taste and decency. They're polite and noble. They don't want to do this, so they limit gently and send the track to the label. The label sends it back. It's not loud enough. This is what the mastering limiter can do. Make the track subjectively louder. The label wants it louder to make it sound like that. The mastering engineer reluctantly makes it louder. <laughs> the track now sounds bad, but it also sounds like that. And of course, it's destined to be a hit. Make a lot of money. And really, it's only the money that counts. To hell with the art. <laughs> but I think there's another thing going on. I think that mastering engineers are competing with each other to make louder and louder tracks. Maybe mastering will have a world championship one day. Who can master a track the loudest? The saddest part of all this is that the listener can turn up or turn down their music as they please. There's no point, no point in making the track itself louder. Oh dear, probably time for your comments now. But just to close this, I'll go back to vinyl. As I said, vinyl can't take as much as CD can. It particularly has difficulty with high levels at high frequency, which is exactly what harmonic enhancement creates. So although a vinyl mastering engineer might like to get a loud cut, he or she can only go so far. The result is that a track might actually sound better on vinyl than on any digital medium. This is irrespective of the various merits and demerits of vinyl. It's in the mastering. Over to you. Do you think that mastering has gone too far? Should we be trusted to control loudness for ourselves? Will we ever go back to the clean audio that we had pre-1995? See you soon.